Gerben sat down in his chair and pulled up the screen in front of him. He sighed a bit. He hadn't watched a lecture for over a year now, and he was perfectly happy with that. But he had promised Hanan he would join. His friend had been spamming his datapad with messages and reminders about the upcoming lecture for two whole days, and there was no chance for Gerben to back out now without looking like an asshat. He couldn't quite figure out what Hanan found so interesting about galactic sociology anyway. By the time any sapient species reached FTL travel, their cultures looked pretty much the same, and any differences were mostly just old traditions they hadn't let go of yet. Hanan, however, had been hyping this lecture up for several days now, and German had to admit that he was starting to get curious. What was so special about these humans, anyway? When he finally clicked into the lecture room, the lecturer had already started talking, and it seemed he had just finished with the introduction and pleasantries. Perfect timing. The speaker was a middle-aged Trinian, with multiple piercings in his head ridges, the very image of a stereotypical university lecturer. He did, however, have a fairly pleasant voice that translated well as he began to speak. The evolution of sapient species is an interesting topic, with over 150 recorded species in the Galactic Compact, there is an impressive data set to study in order to understand the different evolutionary pathways that can lead to sapience. However, our focus for today is more narrow, namely the sociological differences between members of the Compact, and how they can be explained based on the early histories of each species. Gerben scoffed a little bit. History as expected. In today's lecture, we will be focusing on a personal favourite of mine, namely the humans. As you hopefully remember from the previous course on Compact Demographics, the humans are fairly new to interstellar travel, and joined the Compact only 13 years ago. Despite this, they already have claims on four systems with developing colonies in between the Genia and Here One Spiral Arms. Gerben, who obviously hadn't taken the previous course, couldn't recall much about humans. He called up a quick search on his datapad, but the info was sparse and simple. They seemingly hadn't connected their data networks to the galactic web yet. The lecturer continued in the background. In order for us to understand the reasons for their unique sociological development, we need to look closer at their biology and early environment. The humans evolved from tree-dwelling mammals living in small to medium-sized social groups with flat hierarchies. The presentation showed a picture of a group of four-limbed furred creatures climbing trees in a dense forest. German thought they looked a lot like Bridgians, but without the head tentacles. It is believed that a changing climate forced some of these mammals to leave the trees and start living in savannas with tall foliage, where an upright posture was favoured for better vision range and carrying capacity. These environmental changes likely also forced them to diversify their food sources and drove them to search for and gather plant-based foods over a larger area than before. A picture of one of the creatures standing on two limbs in tall grass was shown, now a bit taller and with slightly less fur. Physical evolution had always been interesting to Gerben. There was something satisfying with complexity springing from simple rules. He started to pay a bit more attention to the lecture, and put down his datapad to listen. At this time, the early humans also discovered the high energy density of meat. Although these mammals had likely always been opportunistic omnivores, the early humans now started actively hunting other creatures for food. While this might have caused other species to evolve towards a more predatory physiology with claws or teeth for hunting, the early humans already possessed enough intelligence for basic tool use. This made it possible for them to instead evolve towards a higher intelligence with more advanced tools and cooperative hunting strategies. The presentation displayed a group of humans holding sharpened sticks while surrounding a smaller creature. Fairly basic stuff that most carnivorous or omnivorous species had gone through at some stage. With this higher intelligence came both better recognition of edible plants, but also better interpretation of visual cues. Instead of using scent or thermal tracks for stalking, the early humans relied on spotting disturbed ground or broken foliage to follow the path of their prey. This meant that they could follow from a distance and eliminated the need to immediately overwhelm their prey with speed, as most other predatory species do. Instead, this prompted the evolution of one of the rarest known hunting strategies, persistence hunting. 
Now this was getting interesting. There were only a few species German knew of that used this tactic, and none of them sapient. Simply put, the early humans would follow the tracks of their faster prey at a medium pace, tracking it down and having it run away repeatedly until they had a good chance for an ambush, or the animal was too tired to continue. The humans could then simply walk up to the exhausted creature and bash his head in with a rock. This allowed them to easily hunt animals larger than themselves with little to no danger, and it also heavily favoured individuals with a lot of stamina and intelligence. Gerben was happy that the presentation only showed the humans walking up to an exhausted animal, and not the head-smashing part. He had never been very fond of gore. But he could not figure out what this had to do with sociology. This hunting style alone would be interesting enough for a lecture, but what we will focus on today is the secondary effects this had on humanity. This unusually high stamina allowed groups of early humans to travel further in search of food without it becoming a net loss of energy. It also meant that they became more likely to migrate further to new and better areas for hunting and gathering. And this is where the big split in sociological evolution took place. For most intelligent species, it was simply not energy efficient to travel or expand too far at this stage of their evolution. When their populations grew larger than their environment could support through hunting or gathering, they were forced to develop more sustainable strategies or face starvation. Most of the intelligent species still here today develop farming or animal husbandry at this stage of their history, with their hunter-gatherer periods being comparatively short. The humans, however, did not face this evolutionary pressure, and can therefore boast of the longest hunter-gatherer stage of any known sapient species, and this by a ridiculous margin. It is estimated that the humans remained at this stage for over 3 million years, with the closest contender only reaching 800,000. The live chat was filling up with amazed and amused reactions, mostly amused. Staying for so long at such an early evolutionary stage was not exactly something to boast about. German almost felt a bit bad for the humans. This also meant that early human ancestors could expand over a larger territory than any other species at this stage. Different early subspecies of humans separated and travelled, following migrating animals or simply moving out of other groups' hunting grounds. With the invention of new tools and quick identification of new food sources, early human ancestors and related subspecies spread into other biomes than their native savanna and learned to thrive there. The version of the species that contemporary humans descend from is thought to have migrated to every large landmass on their planet within less than 300,000 years, and this while still in the hunter-gatherer stage. German had to blink a few times to clear his mind. Had he heard that correctly? The entire planet? The picture on the presentation seemed to confirm it. A map of an unknown planet with several arrows indicating migratory paths out from a continent near the equator. Wait, how did they reach that island? This is what truly separates human early sociology from that of other sapien species. Most species are careful not to spread further than their communication technology can allow them to maintain cohesion, and the ones that fail usually end up having the different factions fight each other until cohesion is reached again. Complete planetary conquest usually only happens after the implementation of radio, or at least electricity. The humans, however, had started spreading out before they discovered the value of cohesion, and their unique physiology allowed them to simply pack up and leave if disagreements arose in their communities. Even with the limited sociological knowledge German had, he could guess that many of these disagreements were solved through more violent methods than simply leaving. The humans must have a bloody history behind them. Since so their technological level was so low, even when migrating to objectively hostile environments, there was a large difference in the speed and direction of technological and sociological advancements. Like any other species, they eventually developed farming. Unlike other species, they did so at least three times, independent of each other. This should give you a clue as to what kind of sociological differences we are talking about. Once again, the chapters flooded with amazement and amusement. German had to admit that discovering farming three times was pretty impressive, and showed a good biological foundation for technological development. It was also objectively stupid to have to do this separately, instead of sharing the knowledge with the whole species. After the discovery of farming, the humans could begin living in larger groups than before. In other sapien species, this would be called the society founding stage, where innovation, occupational specialization, and trade are in focus, and in this the humans were similar. 
The only difference was that instead of growing one civilization, they were growing hundreds. The map of the presentation showed countless little green dots popping up, growing and fading on nearly all of the continents. The humans must have numbered it the millions. From around 12,000 years ago to near the present age, different human groups settled and grew agricultural societies all over their planet. Stage 2 civilizations with larger cities and organized governments started to arise around 6,000 years ago. Some of these civilizations lasted millennia, while others died out or dispersed after only decades. Communication between them was limited to the speed of a walking human. Their speed is admittedly impressively fast, but this still ensured that technological development spread slowly and unevenly, with most civilizations being forced to innovate almost independently of each other. Hundreds of different languages, writing systems, numerical systems and ideologies arose naturally, and while this made communication and trade more difficult, it also gave a better chance of optimization by selection. Without one dominant culture to shape innovation, many different incompatible developmental paths were explored, and the best technologies and ideas of each were spread and adopted. Gerben was starting to understand what was so special about the humans. With a hundred civilizations at once instead of just one, of course they were going to develop in strange ways, but something felt off to him. The timeline was too close to the present age. Around 700 years ago, some societies had reached the Sage Free Mark, while other groups of humans still lived as hunters and gatherers. This disparity laid the groundwork for some unique forms of conflict and societal expansion that no other species could have even imagined until the first interactions with other sapient species. Wars with enormous differences in technological advancement, unreconcilable ideological differences leading to outright genocide, and fully developed civilizations fighting each other for conquest or glory, human history is drenched in its own blood. While German felt a tiny bit proud at his correct prediction, he also felt revulsed. Civil wars happened, and regular wars happened, but these were rare and usually not worth the trouble. For a species to regularly engage in warfare at that stage of development was worrying, to say the least. He was hoping he wasn't watching a lecture about the new Trawagians. Thankfully, the lecturer didn't show any pictures of this. The presentation was again showing the map with the green dots, though now they were more like large blotches. The western landmass had recently begun showing a much stronger green blotch growing in from the right. This age also contained many technological advances. Hydropower, steam power and even combustion were incorporated into increasingly more complex machines, exponentially increasing production at an incredible rate. The proper harnessing of electricity further sped up development, and only a few centuries after reaching stage 3, humanity had reached the technological era. This was what German had noticed earlier. A species going from being capable of global expansion to join in the galactic combat in just 700 years seemed almost impossible without outside interference. As you surely have understood by now, human technological development has been the fastest natural development of any species known to the combat, and their unique sociological development is the main explanation. Aside from diverging technological paths due to the lack of centralization that sped up the discovery of key technologies, a more sinister drive towards advancement has also been uniquely present in human history. With their near constant state of inter-societal conflict, the different societies continually competed for technological advantage. This pushed innovation far beyond normal levels, and often beyond what was actually beneficial for the species. They threw themselves headfirst into dangerous technologies such as nuclear fission, before they even identified all the elementary particles and they invented faster than light travel with only the barest understanding of the quantum field. That statement made German raise his back spikes. As an FDL technician in training, he knew the potentially universe-destroying effects of some quantum field-related technologies. That a species had dabbled in FDL without knowing the full dangers made him very uncomfortable. How close had they all been to disaster? Thankfully, the humans stopped their internal fighting soon before making contact with the galactic community. The last 50 years have been the most peaceful in human history, and they recently formed a united government in order to join the compact. They do, however, maintain many of their cultural differences, with many groups being largely independent under the unified government. One could easily think that their strange history would make it difficult for them to interact with other sapient species, but the opposite has proven to be true. Every time that two human civilizations have interacted, be it through warfare, 
alliances or cultural exchange, they have learned something invaluable that most species only learn after leaving their planet. Coexistence. They know of diplomacy, how to make trade agreements, how to unify differing legal systems, and maybe most importantly, they know how to have empathy from someone with a completely different history and values than themselves. They have practiced these scenes for longer than the combat has existed, and they have mastered them. Their violent history has made them skilled in making peace, and it is all thanks to an early divergence in their evolutionary path. Persistence hunting made them wanderers, warmongers, inventors and peacemakers all at once, and I firmly believe that further study of human history will be an invaluable source of new information for the compact. The lecturer trailed off into more finishing words before taking questions from the audience. Jerbin was barely paying attention anymore. He was deep in thought, digesting the new information he had learned, and the assumptions that had been crushed. He only moved after his datapad pinged with an incoming message from Hanan. Did you watch it? The message said. Jerbin replied that yes, he had, and received the answer. You should come to the party at Wygens tonight. There is this guy called Frederick that I think you'd like to meet.